We live, we love, we serve. To you, put those hands together. Stand on your feet. Give God the praise that God deserves this evening. I know you didn't push your way, press your way here on a Tuesday night to look at me. Is there anybody here who came because God's been good? God's been better than good. God's been better to us than we've been to ourselves. Come on, FCBC. Come on and give God some praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Where are the worshipers? Where are the worshipers? Are there any worshipers in the building? I, I see you. 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 Ah, and God sees you too. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, all right, all right. We thank God for that praise team. We thank God for the music ministry, the musicians, the band. Thank you for leading us with excellence this evening. We honor the spirit of God that is already moving, already speaking, already working in this place tonight. Amen. FCBC, it is an honor to be back here again. You didn't have to invite me the first time, but the fact that you invited me back, I feel so honored, so honored to celebrate and share with you for your spring revival. If I'm honest though, Pastor, I, I didn't know if we were gonna be able to have service tonight because the way my brother, the Reverend Willie Francois, preached up in here last night, I didn't know if there was gonna be a pulpit, I didn't know if there was gonna be a roof, I didn't know if there was gonna be a church. But I see he left a little something for me, so I'm grateful. I gotta text him later and say thank you, thank you, thank you. To Pastor Mike, come on and put your hands together for your pastor. Yeah. So grateful for him. Pastor, thank you for just being you. Just being you, being. Thank you for being kind. Everybody's not kind. Thank you for being sincere. Thank you for just being generous with your time and your wisdom and your resources. I don't have to tell you FCBC, y'all know that your pastor is the real deal. He's the real deal. to your executive pastor, Pastor Lakeisha. Um, let me tell you something about Pastor Lakeisha. Pastor Lakeisha just helped me put my whole dissertation together in a five minute conversation. So I'm, I'm definitely grateful um, to her, to all of the leaders and to all of the ministers and members here. Um, I have to give a special shout out and I know she's not here, but I hope she's watching. I have to give a special shout out to Sharon, pastor's assistant. And that, yeah, yeah. That shout out is from my assistant because my assistant just appreciates when the other churches on the other end have good assistance and she doesn't have to work so hard. So I am grateful for the relationship that the two of them have developed. And of course, last but certainly not least, to my Elmwood family. My Elmwood family is here. They have come from New Jersey to be here to support me. And I know that there are others watching online and I am so grateful for my church, my church that's in the building today and my members, I appreciate you so much. All right, now that protocol has been established and shout outs have been shouted out, let's get to the reason you showed up tonight. FCBC, I love that your spring revival falls at the intersection of Lent and Women's History Month. I love that. The fact that we are celebrating and elevating women's voices and, and their stories during the 40-day period when we are journeying with Jesus to the cross is so fitting. 
It's so fitting because that is how Jesus spent his life and his ministry, celebrating and elevating the lives of women. It is no secret that women played an integral role in the life and ministry of Jesus. Women followed Jesus, ministered alongside Jesus. Women funded Jesus' movement out of their own resources. It was a woman that Jesus met at a well who was the first to evangelize. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. It was a woman who anointed his body for burial. It was the women who stood at the foot of the cross. It was the women who went to the tomb early on Sunday morning. And it was a woman who first preached the good news. I have seen the Lord. So it just makes sense in my mind that the celebration of Lent coincides with the celebration of women because the, of the significant role women have played in the Jesus movement. And so it is with this in mind that I invite you to join me at our scripture passage this evening. From the Gospel of Luke, the 17th chapter, verses 10 through 12, we find these words recorded. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. If you like the King James Version, woman, thou art loosed. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, we have gathered in this space today. We have worshipped you. We have sing song we've sing songs of worship to you we have cried out we have called out to you now god is the opportunity that we get to hear from you so god we ask that you speak tonight someone has shown up here raising the question what does god have to say about what i'm going through speak lord your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand. For just a few moments, family, I want to preach from the thought, the burden of strength the burden of strength. Women's History Month not only provides an opportunity to celebrate women's stories and elevate women's voices, but it also allows us to illuminate women's issues. Issues that have impacted women's lives for years, but have historically been marginalized by mainstream society. Issues that have been relegated to the sidelines. Issues that have been dismissed, denied, and regarded only as women's issues. Women's History Month allows us to center women's experiences and highlight the issues impacting their lives. So that is precisely what I plan to do tonight, FCBC, to use this sermonic moment to shed light on a condition that has plagued the lives of black women for centuries. And outside of women's groups and women's gatherings and women's group chats, we don't talk enough about this issue. 
but that changes tonight. Tonight we are going to talk about a condition known as the strong black woman syndrome. Brothers, if you are listening and, and, and listening to this and thinking, uh, well, I'm going to just check out because she came to talk to the women tonight, let me encourage you not to do that. This is not a women's message because if you have a mother, a sister, a wife, a daughter, a girlfriend, a boo, a bae, this message is for you. Because what impacts women impacts you. What impacts women impacts the family. What impacts women impacts the community. What impacts women impacts the church. If the women are not well, no one is well. I promise I want to come back. <laughs> I do. I do. If you were to ask anyone from any race or any background to describe black women, the first thing they will say is that black women are strong. For years, black women have worn the strong black woman designation as a badge of honor. But don't be fooled. <laughs> Being called strong is not a compliment. It's not a compliment, it's a cultural expectation. It has historically functioned as a harmful stereotype that places unnecessary and unwarranted pressure on black women to be resilient, self-sacrificing, unwavering in, in the face of adversity and emotionally strong even at the expense of their own well-being. In her book, Too Heavy a Yoke, Black Women and the Burden of Strength, Dr. Shaniqua Walker Barnes opens her introduction with these words. Ten years ago, I came to the startling realization I was a strong black woman, and being one was not working for me. Dr. Walker Barnes goes on to say that she was in a state of physical and emotional crisis. The physical crisis included high blood pressure, weight gain, insomnia, fatigue, headaches, and frequent illnesses. The emotional crisis included chronic self-doubt, low self-esteem, mood swings, and feelings of rage. On top of that, she says, I was lonely. I felt alienated, detached, and abandoned. There was no one whom I can count on, no one who could and would take care of me in the way that I took care of others. If this is hidden for you, Dr. Walker Barnes is able to portray precisely what black women have experienced for years. For far too long, black women have been crumbling under the pressure of doing too much. Crumbling under the pressure of having to take care of everybody and their mamas too. Crumbling under the pressure of being the go-to person at work because everyone in the office knows if you wanna get it done and get it done right, give it to a black woman. But here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. They will give the work to a black woman, but they won't give the credit to black women. They will give the project to black women, but they won't give the promotion to black women. They'll give the assignment to black women, but when the work is done, they won't give the accolades to black women. 
Black women have been crumbling from having to fight against racism, sexism, classism, and all forms of systemic and structural injustices. For far too long, black women have had to carry all of this and be strong and be resilient and be beautiful and smell good and oh yeah don't forget to smile don't forget to smile because you can be a strong black woman but you can't be an angry black woman so don't forget to smile don't forget Listen, 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 do me a favor. The next time you come across a black woman who doesn't smile, I don't want you to assume it's because she's mean. Maybe she's not smiling because she's carrying too much. Maybe she's not smiling because she is bent and at her breaking point. We gonna get free in here today. We gonna get free. We gonna get free. Black women know the pain of being bent from carrying too much. But we always know the pain of, we also know the pain of being dismissed and silenced by a society that uses black women but doesn't care about the burdens of black women. So what do we do? What do we do when society dismisses our pain? What do we do when we are overlooked at work and, and overlooked in, in these systems and these structures? Well, when society silences us, we come to church hoping that the church will affirm us, praying that the church would acknowledge us and offer us some relief. But instead of finding the relief we need, the church tells us to keep silent too. Not this church. I'm talking about the church down the street. Because I know your pastor. Not this church. The church has historically told women, look, I know you're carrying too much, but keep silent. I know that you're bent and at your breaking point, but keep that to yourself. I know that you are crumbling under the pressure of all that society has placed on you, but the Lord will make a way somehow. God will never put more on you than you can bear. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? We all have crosses to bear. These are the messages that the church has given to women who have been crumbling under the pressure of everything they've had to carry. But tonight, somebody say tonight. Tonight there is a new message coming out of the church. There is a new message and if you are here and you are bent and at your breaking point, there is a new message for you. Come on with me to our scripture passage this evening because it is there that we meet a woman whose name is never mentioned, but for years she has been identified by her condition. Can you imagine? We don't know what to call her but we know her condition. We don't know her identity, but we know her issue. We don't know who she is, but we know what she's going through. See, this is the reason we need Women's History Month, because history will write your story and leave your name out of it. We need to write our own stories, because if not, people will write them and leave you out and put their spin on it. 
The woman in our text is described as having a spirit of infirmity that caused her to be bent and unable to stand up straight. The text doesn't say how she got this way, but it does say uh, that she has been this way for 18 years. This woman has been bent and unable to stand for 18 years. Pastor, let me tell you how I know that I have grown as a person and as a preacher. Because, Reverend Lakeisha, when I looked at this text early in my ministry, when I had no experience, no children, I wasn't married, let me tell you, I, I celebrated this woman for being bent and not broken. I celebrated the fact that she had been struck with a spirit of infirmity, but she still showed up. I shouted over the fact that this woman made it to the temple for 18 years despite her condition. But now I'm good and grown. And when I look at this text now, I have a completely different perspective. I no longer celebrate this woman's ability to show up while bent. Right now, at this stage of my life, I'm trying to figure out why is she bent in the first place. And after years of being bent, why is she in the same position today that she was in 18 years ago? I have some questions. I have some questions. Can I ask some questions tonight? My first question is where are her relatives? Is she married? Does she have children? If not, where are her nieces and nephews? Where are her cousins, Ray Ray Shaniqua in them? Where is the support from her family? Where is the village? I have some questions. My second question is, where are the resources? This woman has been bent for 18 years. Who is advocating for her? What systems are in place to assist her? Is it the healthcare system, social services? What community resources are available to support this woman who has been bent and unable to stand for 18 years. Where are her relatives? Where are the resources? And my final question is, where is the religious community? The people of faith, the church. This woman has been coming to the synagogue for 18 years, bent and unable to stand. What does the church have to say about her condition? As I raise these questions tonight, I see so many similarities between the woman in our text and the strong black woman. Can I point them out? First of all, both the woman in our text and the, and the black woman are suffering. And they are both, and they both have been suffering for years. This woman's condition has caused her to suffer in ways that impacted every facet of her life. It had to impact her social life. She couldn't do the things she used to do before. She couldn't go out. There was no brunch and mimosas. She couldn't meet people. I don't know what brunch and mimosas is because I'm usually working at that time, but I heard it's pretty good. I know you know what it is. That's why y'all not at church. I'm, I'm just talking to my members. I'm sorry. I'm sure you don't have that problem, Pastor. condition impacted her socially. She couldn't look people in the eye. She couldn't shake people's hands. She, being bent restricted and limited how she moved and how she showed up and how she navigated the world. 
This woman was bent and could not do the things she used to do. And the sad reality is tonight, and I know that no one here wants to hear this, but I gotta say it anyway. As much as we want to believe that the people in our lives love us for who we are, most people are in our lives not because of their love for us, but because they love what we do for them. They love that we show up for them. They love that we can help them, that we're always available to them. They love the fact that we are always there to listen to them and, and to hold them when they need to be held. But the moment we can't do the things we used to be able to do for them, we don't see them, we don't hear from them, they don't call. We don't get text messages from them. Listen, listen, if you are here trying to figure out why you no longer hear from someone in your life, let me help you. It's not you, it's them. They were never in your life because of you. They were there because of what you could do what you could do for their life, what you could do for their career, what, they, what you could do for their advancement. And the moment you became either unwilling or unable to do, they left. Uh, I believe that the woman in our text knows what that feels like. She was bent and could no longer do the things she used to do, and I'm sure it cost her some relationships. Some best friend was like, well, you know, I'm just tired of always having to come to you. All we do is sit up in your house. You know how people are. She was bent, and it cost her some relationships. Uh, this woman, this woman was not only suffering socially, she was suffering emotionally. Can you imagine the emotional toll that comes with being bent and unable to stand? This woman had to change everything about her life to accommodate her bent position. This woman couldn't eat the same, sleep the same, sit the same, worship the same. Everything about her life needed to change to accommodate her bent position. Do you know the emotional toll that comes with the realization that life as you know it will never be the same? Not only, not only was this woman suffering socially, not only was she suffering emotionally, she was suffering spiritually. Jewish law prohibited people with, that were differently abled from entering the temple. So to add stress and strain to the stress and strain of being bent and unable to stand, this woman had to go to worship and sit next to people who didn't even think she should be there. there because her condition was an inconvenience to them. And I wonder if there is anybody in the FCBC sanctuary or, or anyone in the virtual sanctuary who knows what it feels like to be an inconvenience. Has anyone here ever been told that you're an inconvenience? That your life is an inconvenience? That your pain is an inconvenience? That asking for what you need is an inconvenience? Have you ever felt like an inconvenience? Women know what it feels like to be an inconvenience. And just like the woman in our text, black women are suffering socially, emotionally, and spiritually. Black women are so busy taking care of everyone else, they don't have time to take care of themselves. The black woman is overworked, overwhelmed, overfunctioning, and overextended. She is so busy being resilient that she doesn't have time to nurture the relationships in her life. 
Black women are so focused on being strong that they don't have time to experience emotions like joy, intimacy, peace. And what is this soft life that I keep hearing so much about lately? What is that? Black women are suffering emotionally from depression and low self-esteem and anger and resentment. And instead of taking time to properly tend to their emotions, the black woman pushes through her pain, pushes through her pain to get to work, pushes through her pain to show up for her kids, pushes through her pain to make sure she gets to church. The strong black woman is also suffering spiritually. We come to church, the place that is supposed to foster an authentic encounter with God, but instead of showing up authentically, we come to church and act like everything is perfect. We pretend like everything is all right, like we have it all together. We are bent and at our breaking point, but if someone asks, sister, how you doing? We say, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. Black women do not have safe spaces and places to show up authentically and it is impacting our spiritual and emotional well-being. Like the woman in our text, we are suffering and most of us have been suffering for more than 18 years. The second thing the woman in our text and the strong black woman have in common is that despite their suffering, they show up. I can only imagine what it took for this woman to show up at the synagogue that day. What time did she have to wake up? How long did it take her to get dressed? How far did she have to walk to get there? It could not have been easy, family. But despite the pain, despite the obstacles, despite the challenges, this woman shows up. And let me tell you something about the strong black woman. One thing the strong black woman gonna do is show up. Despite the pain, despite our feelings, despite the obstacles, the challenge, we gonna get up, we gonna dress up, we gonna do our makeup, and we gonna show up. We show up for our families because we are the glue that keeps everything together. We show up for work even when we are sick because no one in the office knows where the printer paper is. We show up to church because, well, where would the church be if it wasn't for the women? The one thing black women gon' do is show up even when we are bent and at our breaking point. The third thing the woman in our text and the strong black woman have in common is that despite our suffering, we show up. And when we show up, we are silent. This woman comes to the synagogue and she doesn't say anything. She is bent and unable to stand and she doesn't complain about her pain. She doesn't speak up about her suffering. She doesn't advocate for what she needs. She suffers in silence. I see the same thing in black women. Black women are bent and at their breaking point and we don't complain about our pain. We don't speak up about our suffering. We don't advocate for our needs. We don't want to be an inconvenience. So we suffer and we suffer silently. The culture has conditioned us to be this way. We have been conditioned to believe that in order to be good mothers, we just have to do what we need to do. In order to be good wives, don't complain too much, don't nag too much. 
in order to be good at our jobs. Take the extra work, but don't you dare take the credit. Just take on more and more and more and shh, keep silent. But this woman's silence is not the only silence I want to lift up tonight. Responsible preaching requires me to acknowledge another silence in the text. And I need for us to take notice of the silence of the faith community in this passage. This woman was bent for 18 years at her breaking point for 18 years, suffering for 18 years, and for 18 years, this community of faith remained silent about her condition. For 18 years, they pretended not to notice her suffering. And here is what I have to say to this faith community. I say shame on you. Shame on you and any faith community that remains silent about the conditions that are adversely impacting the lives of God's people. This woman was suffering. And the church was silent. But you know what? Because up until now, it's been all bad news. But we are at the point where I have some good news for you tonight, FCBC. I, I have some good news tonight. This woman was suffering. The church was silent. But you know what? There is good news. The church may have been silent about this woman's condition. The church may have been silent about her suffering. The church may have been silent about her pain. But on this day... On this day, Jesus had something to say. On this day, Jesus was in the building and the church may have been okay with this woman coming for 18 years, bent and unable to stand, but Jesus was not okay with her suffering. For years, women have been told, like Jesus, we should suffer in silence. Jesus never said a mumbling word, and we should not mumble either. But I came to give you a different word today, because our text is proof that Jesus has something to say about our condition. Our text is proof that Jesus is not okay with our suffering, period. How do we know that Jesus is not okay with her suffering? Well, in a crowded synagogue that was probably filled with people, Jesus sees this woman not her condition. He doesn't see her as an inconvenience. He doesn't see what she's going through. The text tells us that Jesus sees her. This is good news. This is good news. It's good news for the women who often feel unseen. It's good news for women who feel like no one sees them. It's good news for women who feel like no one sees all that you are carrying, that no one sees that you are bent and at your breaking point. For every woman who has spends the entire weekend cleaning the house and you don't think that people see. For the woman who gets up early and heads to work, taking two buses and a train and then has to come back home to take care of the kids and, and get dinner together and you think that no one sees. This text is good news for all of you because Jesus sees. Jesus sees how hard we work. 
Jesus sees our struggles. Jesus sees all that we do. Jesus sees that we are bent and at our breaking point. The good news in the text is that when everyone else pretended like this woman was not bent, Jesus sees her. That's not just good news for women, that's good news for everyone and anyone who has ever felt overlooked and unseen. When people don't see you, the good news is Jesus sees you. Not only, not only does Jesus see her, but he stops the entire service just to save her. Stops the entire service just for her. Jesus cared about her condition and unlike the church folk and, and unlike the family and the community folk, Jesus was not going to go on business as usual as long as this woman was bent in worship. Can you imagine how many people would be saved if the church was willing to suspend church as usual and actually cared about people's condition? If we were willing to shut service down to make sure that lives were transformed and hearts were changed and needs were met and resources were provided. Jesus provides a model in the text. Jesus says, I see a woman who is bent and unable to stand. I see a woman who is struggling and suffering and she's been going through this for 18 years we can't go on with singing praise and worship as usual we can't go on with the reading of scripture as usual we can't go on preaching as usual Jesus shuts it down and he shuts it down for this one woman to address this one need and I just came by to remind somebody in FCBC today that we serve a God that will shut it down for you shut it down who will tell them we will not go on business as usual until my daughter is healed. We won't go on business as usual until my son is delivered. We won't go on business as usual until everyone has what they need. Jesus says we can't go on when there's folks still suffering and, and folks are still struggling and, and folks are crumbling under the pressures of life we can't go on church as usual and business as usual Jesus shuts it down and I don't know at what point I don't know if it was at the doxology I don't know if he stopped the sermon but whatever it was he shut it down and he looked at that woman's condition he saw what she was going through and he said no nah, we can't go on until she is healed Jesus will shut it down for you shut it down for you Jesus shuts down the service and says to this woman woman you are set free from your ailment and the text says that immediately she stood up straight there was no delayed reaction. There was no delay. She's, the text says that immediately she stood up straight. 
And listen, I'm, I'm almost done. I got to get back to Jersey. But listen, for the women who may be suffering from strong black woman syndrome, I have come to let you know that Jesus sees your suffering. Jesus cares about your condition. The church may have been silent. Your family may have been silent. Society may have been silent about your condition, but Jesus has disrupted church as usual tonight. He has disrupted revival as usual tonight because there is a word for you. There is a word for you. There is a word for you. And the word is woman, you are set free. You are set free tonight, immediately. No delayed reaction, not next week, not next month, but tonight you are set free. Pastor, from what? You're set free from the cultural expectation that you have to be the strong one. You are set free from the pressure of having to take care of everything and everybody. Woman, you are set Set free from feeling like an inconvenience, like your pain is an inconvenience, like your existence is an inconvenience. Woman, you are set free from having to sacrifice your time, your health, your joy, your well-being, your life so that others can live. You are set free from being overwhelmed, overworked and overextended you are set free from the guilt of taking time to care for yourself woman you are set free from feelings of unworthiness the feeling of not being good enough woman you are set free from anything that has you bent and at your breaking point we no longer have to be burdened by strength. I came to let you know Jesus has set us free. So act like it, walk like it, speak like it, dance like it, praise like it. Jesus has interrupted church at FCBC to let some woman know you are free. You don't have to be bent and at your breaking point. You are free. So let me tell you what that means. That means you are free to take the trip. Free to book the flight. Free to set the boundary. Free to say no. Woman, you are free to take the class. Free to go back to school. Free to date who you want. Free to hang out whenever you want. Free. Woman, you are free. You are no longer bent, no longer bound. Jesus has set you free. Now go and live that free life, that soft life. Go and live your life because you are free, unburdened, not stressed, free. Go live.